Thank you for joining us for what's technically the fourth seminar in the 2023 Spring Science of the News Seminar series. Um, our speaker, or t the tonight's talk will have three parts, and after each part, we'll pause for questions from the audience. So we can take questions from anyone in person or if you're watching on our YouTube stream. If at any point you have a question, feel free to drop that into the chat, and we will relay it to our speaker during these question and answer sessions. I, again, you can do that at any point during the talk. Um, after the questions, we'll take a brief break just to uh, rest for a minute and grab some water, and then we'll get started with the next part. So, our speaker tonight is Makoto Kelp, a PhD student in the Atmospheric Chemistry Modeling Group in the Department of Earth and Planetary Sciences here at Harvard. And tonight, he'll be telling us about democratizing air quality and Google Air Pollution Sensor Networks. presentation with um, the map of the United States um, Air Quality Monitoring Network given by the United States government, the United States EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency. And you know, I was sitting in class one day, this is a map that I've seen many, many times. This is a class that I've taken and then TA'd multiple times. And kind of just blankly staring at this, one day it just kind of clicked within me um, that, you know, uh, this configuration of this network is really unequally distributed. We have way more sensors in the east than in the west. You have way, uh, sensors more in urban areas rather than rural ones, and there's a, a higher density around the coast than rather than more inland. And I thought, you know, why does it look like this? Why are there no sensors in Nevada, for example? So um, this kind of whole project uh, kind of started out as where are, why does this sensor network look like this? And what this sensor network is measuring is PM2.5 air pollution. This is kind of our classic figure of contextualizing what PM2.5 is, so you have an idea in your head. PM2.5 is um, particulate matter that is 2.5 micrometers across in diameter, so it's very thin, you know, it's uh, smaller than the uh, width of a human hair. And uh, PM2.5 particulate matter is an aerosol, so it can be a suspended liquid or gas, and it kind of floats around in our atmosphere. And what's really is interesting about PM2.5 is that it has a huge amount of health effects. It's the atmospheric chemical species with the largest burden on human health. And this kind of transpires in multiple ways. You have um, effects on lungs, cardiovascular effects. So you can have, because they're so small in diameter, they can penetrate deep into the lungs, into the alveoli sacs and then cause sort of asthma attacks, and they're also carcinogenic, so they're cancer-causing. It's this kind of huge, nasty source of pollution. Uh, there's effects on the human heart, and it can cause heart attacks and strokes. Um, you know, this constant inhalation of this kind of air pollution leads to long-term health effects on the heart. And also, particulate matter that's, you know, this small and even smaller, which we call ultrafine particles, are small enough to penetrate the blood-brain barrier through your eyes. So you have um, you know, this uh, increased risk of stroke, headache, uh, links to dementia, especially around regions near an airport um, that has uh, sort of a huge amount of spewing from the uh, engines of an aircraft. And finally, we also know that there are fetal effects for when people are pregnant that um, PM2.5 can then lead to um, impacts in the womb. And so we know that PM2.5 has both health effects and climatic effects. Um, climate being higher up in the atmosphere, the aerosols can sort of affect the radiation budget of the Earth. But I'm going to mainly talk about PM2.5 at the surface, which mainly deals with health effects to humans. And what's really interesting about PM2.5 is that it has this really um, unique behavior in both space and time. Um, it's a unique ability in space is that it comes from a variety of different sources. You know, you can have uh, PM2.5 come from factories, um, it can come from the tailpipe of cars, it can come from power plants in the Midwest, for example. Um, there are natural sources of PM2.5, such as dust in Arizona and New Mexico. Um, we know that it can also form PM2.5 in the atmosphere, it can be directly emitted, but also form secondarily where if you put a bunch of ammonia fertilizer in the Midwest, that can volatilize and create PM2.5 air pollution kind of up in the atmosphere. 
Um, also, here's an image of wildfires. So PM2.5 smoke from wildfires can um, emanate from you know here in the West Coast and is very sensitive to the weather. So it can um, be immediately rained out if there's a thunderstorm, or it can slowly travel across the country if there's this nice convective breeze. Um, and it's sort of behavior and time is also interesting. Here is a data from the United States EPA, where on the x-axis we have the number of years, the last 20 years, and on the y-axis it's the average concentrations of this in the United States. But right now in the United States, and sort of a annual average of 12 micrograms per cubic meter is our regulatory standard, and you notice that over time things have been getting cleaner in the United States. You know, this is actually a pretty nice policy win in the United States. We have, um, we're installing scrubbers on power plants and catalytic converters in cars. And this air pollution is really getting cleaner over time. And so if I go back to this configuration of this sensor network, I tell you that a lot of this was really designed with 1980s and 1990s air pollution in mind. That's when this sensor was optimized. Um, and the dominant drivers of air pollution then were from wild, uh, excuse me, were from cities. So cities emitted the most pollution. Uh, from on-road transportation, freeways, cars, and transportation emitted a bunch of pollution. And uh, power plants. That's why you see so many of these kind of uh, stations set up in the Midwest near a big power plant. However, we know that today the dominant new driver of air pollution in the U.S. is from wildfires in the West. And we kind of asked the question, you know, because this network was optimized with air pollution from 30 years ago in mind, is it really capturing the pollution of today? And you know, what I have to say is that the EPA, you know, we can easily kind of bash them because they're a government agency, government run, but really um, it's, they represent the gold standard of monitoring air quality in the United States. We have, um, uh, each of those sensor locations that I showed on the previous slide, each of these locations costs around $200,000 to set up. It has a ton of instrumentation, and this is not even including the upkeep cost of these locations. However, because of this government agency is kind of big and slow moving, they're not really quick to uh, add new sensors, but there's this idea that perhaps a new generation of low cost sensor networks and citizen science might fill in the gaps that the EPA is missing. Here is uh, the Purple Air Company. It's the largest low-cost sensor kind of company in the world right now. It has you know, tens of thousands of sensors. Basically what you do is you pay 300 bucks or something for a sensor, you connect it to the internet, put it outside your house, and you can upload those concentration measurements in real time. And it's kind of been championed as this uh, democratization of air quality data. Anyone can buy this, anyone can upload data to the cloud, and we have this new uh, sort of a uh, way to fill in the gaps of traditional measurement techniques. However, this really great paper uh, by Priyanka de Souza finds that these purple air sensors are statistically significantly more often deployed in wider and higher income areas. And not only are they wider and higher income, but they're also in areas that are cleaner than the average EPA sensor. So there's this kind of built-in racial income bias when you kind of volunteer science, right? Anyone can do it, let's see who does it, and there's this kind of built-in racial component to it. And that's important because in the United States, like I said, air pollution is getting cleaner over time, but there's this consistent gap between um, sort of white Americans, wealthier Americans, and then people of color and low income. That Overall, as time goes by, that these uh, concentration exposures are going down, but that gap remains the same. And this is important because this can lead to mischaracterization, misattribution of health effects for these most vulnerable of communities. Um, also during sort of the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, there were studies that found that African American communities responded differently to vaccines and differently to sort of incidences of COVID and sort of levels of stress, which then later impact, uh, sort of create a higher uh, health burden onto them. So there's this also um, equity component of monitoring that might be not captured. And so I asked the question, what really has been done for sensor placement? You know, uh, I kind of motivated this with different aspects of new and old drivers of air pollution. and. What kind of algorithmic, data-driven way can we create a new sensor network? 
And what I found is that not much has been done in terms of this kind of field. On the left, I found uh, results of running computational fluid dynamics simulations. So how air can move in a room, air is a fluid, how that moves in a room, and where we can place sensors to capture that pollution. This is a very cool idea, but really it's a very small domain. You know, it's in a single room. How it, that's not really gonna scale well to the entire United States. And it's very computationally expensive. These, uh, you basically have to solve a million different kind of math equations to run these models, and that um, doing so over the entire United States is just way too difficult. Uh, on the right is a sensor network that was designed with Cambridge in the UK. So this is, um, putting sensors in locations of interest of vulnerable areas. So place, put a sensor next to a hospital, put a sensor next to an elderly care home or a kindergarten. So this is really well-intentioned, but we know that when we have this human-selected component of these networks that we can often incur these biases, even if we don't want to. And so my three uh, guiding questions for this uh, talk will be, one, can we design this new sensor network for the United States? Um, and is it optimal? Optimal meaning, does it capture the full extent of pollution in America today? Two, are there gaps in the current ne uh, EPA network that we have? Again, the EPA network represents this nice gold standard of air quality monitoring. Maybe it's just doing quite well, actually, and this is sort of an ill-founded idea on my part. And three, can we address historic racial and income disparities in our network? Because we find that if we don't explicitly include these kinds of you know, vulnerable groups, then they'll eventually get left out. And you know, this is a, in itself a very interesting kind of optimization problem. And so we'll take a break now for the first third of this talk. I'm happy to take questions. Great, so we can take some questions from the audience. And uh, just as a reminder, if you're watching on our YouTube feed and uh, you have any questions at any point, feel free to type those in the chat and we'll relay them to our speaker. Yeah, if you have a question. So you accept like a lot of the current EPA sensors and a lot of the ones that people can buy have to be connected to the internet or something else is connected to the internet, I suppose. Like, is it because they generate a lot of data that you can't put them in like areas that don't, or are there sensors that you can put in like uh, areas that are not um, connected to the internet? Like, you show them that in a huge swath of the Western United States. It's very sparsely populated on from their side. It's like there's not internet everywhere. Can you put sensors out there or do they like just generate so much data that you can't like store a hard drive with it and then pick it up every once in a while? Yeah, so I guess the utility of the internet cloud feature is that you can get these measurements in real time. So you can store the data sort of on its own in a hard drive, but that's sort of not what they want. They want this kind of nice cloud-based aspect to it. And yeah, I mean, that's a huge you know, limitation of this, right, is you need 300 bucks. Not everyone has 300 bucks that they can just devote to this kind of thing. And you need stable internet connection. You know, even I don't have stable internet connection <laughs> living here. So it's, yeah, so that's why it's tough. Um, yeah, exactly. Any other questions? I have a question. How locally do you get variations in air pollution? Like, I guess you might talk about this in the next part, deciding where to put them. How close to sensors need to be to get like an accurate picture of what's happening? Yeah, so air pollution can, it really depends on the scale. So when you look at the, over the entire United States, you know, we're looking at hundreds of miles, basically, and having sensors one next to the other might look close, but they're actually very far apart. Um, but I'll look more in an urban area and show you what that kind of looks like. And you know, you can have pollution that's different across the street, right? So it's, yeah, the scale is an issue that we'll, we'll talk about in the next two thirds of the talk. Anything else? Okay. I have one other question. I was wondering, uh, with the size of particles, if uh, this is something that like masking can help, like avoid some of these health effects. Hmm. Yeah, so that's uh, sort of a big policy question, especially during wildfire seasons, right? Is it even worth trying to try to clean up wildfire pollution or should we just make everyone wear masks? And it's just so bad that this is a unchangeable problem. And you know, this is something policymakers are kind of juggling with today. But yeah, definitely masking does help, but 
go ahead with further questions for this part. Feel free to put them in the chat and still have it. We'll come back. Uh, we'll take a break for a few minutes and we'll be back in about two minutes. So now we have this kind of mission statement that we're trying to figure out. So in order to create a data-driven sensor network, we need a pretty good data set. And luckily, when I was just starting this project, this uh, data set came out from the Harvard Public Health School that really fit the bill of creating a high-resolution data product. And how it's created is a series of kind of machine-learned fusion techniques. And basically, what it does is it takes uh, PM 2.5 satellite data, so aerosol optical depth. It combines it with weather data, variables, air quality, uh, chemical transport model outputs, and land use terms. So land use terms being, you know, is this over a forest? Is this a city? How many people live here, etc. These kinds of big um, geographic indicators. It smashes those all together and then tries to create a regression problem to mimic these uh, surface network observations that we have that are kind of checker marked um, on the top there. So what it's cr doing is taking a bunch of data, combining it in a kind of nice, optimal, regressive way to create a high resolution data product that mimics the sensor network results that I show you up there. And the data set I show is here, and it's very high resolution, so one kilometer. Um, here it's showing a PM 2.5 concentration, and I have daily data for over seven for 17 years, going from 2000 to the end of 2016. And you see that the dynamics of PM 2.5 that I talked to you about at the beginning of the talk are really present here, where you can have some kind of explosion of pollution, whether that's from a volcano or a factory or a wildfire, and it can immediately be rained out due to weather or slowly travel across the country if there's a nice breeze. And so really what I wanted to do is create a sensor network not based on averages of pollution. You know, anybody can take a data set, take the average, and then put sensors where the average is high, right? What I wanted to do is take and find a way of uh, placing sensors in the most extreme locations, the areas with the most uh, transient uh, pollution episodes, some, so um, you know, a fire that comes and goes in a week, something that can capture those extreme events. And to do that, we use something called dynamic mode decomposition, and what this is, it's a linear algebra technique that can find spatial and temporal information of our data set. 
I'm not going to get too mathy with this, but how it works is step one is collect this data, which I showed you in the previous slide. I have daily data for 17 years worth of the sort of contiguous United States. Um, I just organize them into a simple matrix X. This matrix X on one axis is space, so it's latitude and longitude just kind of squished into one dimension. On the other axis, it's time. So this, I have this matrix X, and I have a second matrix that's called X prime, that's literally the same matrix that's just shifted one time step into the future. And what this DMD approach attempts to do is create this best fit linear model of A that I show here that approximate all of the spatial temporal variations of our data set. And you know, there's a bunch of kind of linear algebra jargon that I can go through, but what it really is showing is that I can get both spatial features that are sort of long-term average variability, and also those that are associated with shorter-term pollution events. And I'll show you why I don't didn't want to work with the average of a data set. So here I'm showing you the average of this 27 or this uh, 17 years worth of data where you see that generally concentrations in the United States are higher in the east than in the west, except for parts of California. Standard deviation, which is kind of a classic statistical measure of variability, kind of mimics the average. It's higher in the uh, east than in the west, except California. This kind of makes sense because standard deviation just operates off of the mean or the average. That's kind of how the, that statistical measure works. But what DMD does is not work off of averages, it really calculates the rapidity of the change in concentration. So it's a re a really a true measure of variability. And what this does is uh, shows different hot spots in the United States that are more variable than the average. We see that in the Great Lakes, we have a couple hot spots. You know, the Great Lakes has very turbulent weather, turbulent meteorology. You have a lot of lake freeze effects that affects concentrations. You have a hot spot in New York City, you know, it makes sense. That's an area with a lot of uh, emissions of PM2.5. Here in Idaho, that's most certainly due to wildfires. If we go down the coast of California, this could be from wildfires, it could be from agricultural activities or, you know, uh, emissions from cities and such. Um, here, um, a fun bright spot here is Salt Lake City, Utah. So that's in, uh, Salt Lake City is in a basin surrounded by mountains. It's an area where it has frequent temperature inversions and caps the pollution in that city, so the city regularly fumigates itself. So it's a really polluted area, just because based on the uh, topography of it. And so I, I write think economics here, because what I really want to do is recenter how we think about these kinds of problems. Because in, what's interesting in economics is not necessarily the average of the economy. You know, we don't really care about how the average consumer economy works. What's really interesting is kind of the boundaries of our problem. You know, what is the tipping point into a recession? What's the tipping point into a depression? And similarly for air pollution, it's the idea that these extreme events are the ones that really dictate what's happening to this system. Okay, and so this is an insane looking figure, but I'll walk you through it. And so what I want to say is that, you know, doing any kind of operation on 17 years worth of data, you're going to average out stuff, you know, that's uh, inevitability. If you have 17 years worth, even something that lasts for a month is going to get averaged out. So what we do is adopt what I call a multi-resolution framework. That's what MR here stands for. And that sounds kind of jargony and fancy, but multi-resolution really just means doing that same mathematical operation, but just on different chunks, time chunks of your data. So how it works is I have my 17 years worth of data for my data set. I do DMD on that, and I get some kind of spatial temporal information. I then catalog that, save that information, take that 17 years worth of data, cut that data set in half, do DMD now on those two halves, save that information in my library, cut those two chunks again in half, I have four chunks, and you go ch -ch 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 until the shortest frequency I have is one day. Now I have this huge amount of data of spatial temporal information, and I have this massive library of data, and I just apply a simple filtering function. And this filter says that if you're within, you know, 10% variability or 
you know, 10% of um, this long-term 17 years worth um, average variability, then you're just the same as that variability. You're noise on top of a background. But if you exceed that concentric filter, that circle of variability that, that I told you about, then you're considered a specific, significant polluting event. And I'm gonna save you in my big, nice library of uh, pollution episodes, and you're, I'll color code you in red. And so that's what I show here. On the x-axis is time, and on the y-axis are those different chunks of time that I told you about. And also, I, sh I should note that something annoying about doing this is because I'm working in operations of base two, meaning you know one day, two days, four days, eight days, uh, there's a point at which I run out of data, and that's around 11 years. So I'm just showing you the first 11 years of this data set. And you see that the long-term 11-year um, variability um, kind of mimics what we see as the average on the previous slide, where you see higher variability in the east than in the west, except for parts of California. And so there are a couple things that you notice here. One is that most of these significant events, and these high pollution episodes, um, are between one week and one month in duration. This actually makes a lot of physical sense because the lifetime of PM2.5 in the atmosphere is around a week. So there's this nice kind of physical basis for that. And so, you know, I have so much data, and at, at first I thought, okay, let's look at what these things mean, uh, especially the long-lived ones, because here's a significant pollution episode that lasted for almost nine months. And you see that the hotspot here is in this San Joaquin kind of central valley in California. I looked, it happened around 2007, and I looked in the San Joaquin Air Pollution Control District's annual report, and found that 2007 was actually a really anomalously bad time for pollution in the valley. You know, this is basically um, a place where America's fruits and vegetables are grown. I think like literally 99% of almonds in the United States are from Central Valley. Um, it's a heavy agricultural and sort of industrial area. Um, it's in a valley it, right next to big mountains and there's frequent temperature inversions that kind of cap pollution. And this was just kind of a term, uh, a long-term period of um, pollution just hanging over this area. Uh, similarly here, let's look at another one. This lasted for almost two months. This happened in the summer of 2007. The hot spot is in Idaho. I look and it corresponds directly with this uh, Murphy complex fire that happened in Idaho. And so what's really interesting is because we have this data set that I built this off of that incorporates you know, observations from satellites and from measurements from the ground, that we can link real world events to this library of data. And we're gonna use this library to place the sensors in the United States. And I'll show you how I do that. So just like our matrix X that I talked about earlier, where one dimension is time, our library of data also has this for, uh, time and space. Our all, library also has one dimension being time, uh, space, excuse me. So latitude and longitude is squished into one dimension. And on the X, um, sort of the columns are what I call modal information here, but that, what that really is are these different uh, time snaps of data and their spatial temporal information. And what we can do is just do a simple reorganization of this library where we find the uh, rows with the largest values. And these large values correspond to higher variability in PM2.5. And these are the rows I identify, and these are the places that we'll put the sensors. So it's really cool because we have this massive library of pollution episodes, and we can place the sensors in the locations that uh, sort of encapsulate best those locations. And this is what it looks like here. And I'll walk you through this because it's a, a little small for the eyes right here. So uh, the EPA sensor network is up top, which I showed you earlier, and then the DMD sensor network is at the bottom. If we look at the eastern seaboard, we mimic the EPA sensor network pretty well, just with a reduced kind of peeled back density of sensors. The Great Lakes region is an area with high variability due to sort of lake freeze effects from Lake Michigan, etc. Um, the EPA has a presence there, and so does our sensor. 
and that generally the eastern United States, when you look at both of these sensor networks, are actually pretty similar. It's just that we have a reduced number of sensors. But the story really changes in the western United States. If we draw a line at the 100th meridian, cutting the country in half, you see that uh, the EPA only has a third of their sensors in the west, whereas we have over half of the sensors from this DMD network. And you might say, hey, actually, there are uh, similar amounts of sensors. Both have around 700 in the western United States. It's, but it's the distribution of those sensors that are quite different. Um, I should also note that you know, there's almost 1,000 fewer sensors in this DMD uh, sensor network that we propose. That's because um, it's based on this library of data that I kind of showed you. And there's a point at which we run out of data in that library. That's why that one schematic I showed with the kind of colored blocks, uh, there's a lot of white space. So at some point we run out of data and that's at a, when we have 1,369 sensors. But let's zoom in on the west. So the EPA sensor network might be under monitoring areas, especially in California. If we look in the San Joaquin Valley, the lower central valley, the EPA has around 15 sensors there. We say that there should be five times as many. You know, this is a very uh, sort of trouble area for air pollution in the US. It, you know, it always exceeds kind of national standards for air quality. Similarly, in Northern California, this is basically wildfire country. There's an under-monitored presence from the EPA there too. And this is important because um, you know, there's a paper that also came out around the same time we published this, where on the top is um, each of those black dots are again EPA monitors in California. And on the base map, the colored blocks under it are uh, concentrations of PM2.5 from wildfires or smoke PM2.5. And you really see a mismatch between where the sensors are and where the pollution is. Similarly, uh, these areas also have huge uh, sort of agricultural worker populations, um, you know, where outside air pollution, smoke from wildfires represents this significant occupational hazard. So, you know, there's again this kind of um, level of equity in monitoring. And, you know, this will be our next break. In the last third of the talk, we'll deal more with uh, sort of addressing equity in monitoring. Great, so um, we can take some questions from the audience. And another reminder, if you're watching on our YouTube stream, feel free to type any questions that you have in the chat and we'll relay them to our speaker. All right, we have a question. Um, uh, this is from our YouTube chat, uh, uh, from James. Um, you, I think this is in reference to a couple of maps are showing that that uh, some what's the large white spot in Arizona? Yeah, so that's a good question. So you can kind of see it here. Um, there's kind of like errors in the data set. So <clears throat> the underlying data set um, kind of uses a bunch of both model and observational data. And sometimes there's kind of errors in the algorithm that does this mapping. And then we had like some uh, kind of a big trouble area in Arizona. So you can kind of see it up in the Pacific Northwest too, where you kind of have holes in the data set. And we just, I just kind of mask these out. So these are just areas that are not considered because there are errors in the data set that would kind of skew the results. Good question. Hi, um, thanks for your talk. I was wondering, since you mentioned DMD captures the rapidity of some atypical occurrences, I was wondering if that information gets also translated to um, standard deviation. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Yeah, so what I'm seeing is for the standard deviation, <clears throat> I guess standard deviation really works off of the mean, right? Because um, it's uh, a measure off of that mean value, assuming some kind of normal distribution, like the first standard deviation, you know, is X percent from the mean. But a lot of uh, air pollution kind of distributions are log normally distributed. So we have some kind of really high tail and then a lower concentration tail or the opposite way. So I think that's the problem with standard deviation is it's not, it doesn't capture things that are not normal. And that's why I really like the DMD. Good question too. Okay. We have another question from our YouTube chat from Evan. Can you comment on the limits of using 24 hour average data as your highest time is often can you repeat that question again? Yeah, uh, it's more of just asking, can you 
Some of Phil, you warned us about uh, the 24 hour average data, your highest resolution for your time. Oh, yeah. So, really, yeah, that's a good question. I mean, that again is going to be a limitation of this data. And in a way, the data set that I showed you earlier, I kind of show it in a very casual fashion, but really, we didn't have that kind of data even a couple years ago. It kind of is unprecedented. Before that, we had satellite um, AOD, which, you know, that's imperfect because it measures the entire column. It doesn't get the surface very well. Uh, we have modeling results, and that's, you know, based on a physics model. It doesn't actually incorporate observations. Um, so, yeah, we're definitely missing sort of diurnal 24-hour differences. You know, we can have higher peaks during traffic time versus off traffic. And so, yeah, we're definitely missing the sub-daily um, dynamics here. Okay, yeah, I think they just commented on this similar line of asking, like, uh, it seems that it might optimize itself for larger regional pollution events rather than, like, local citywide or uh, kind of events. Yes, so that'll play more into the last portion of the talk, but yeah, a lot of that kind of, those signals get crossed when we have a very large domain. So if we look at the, you know, signal across the entire United States, um, you know, you'll have a, a huge number of sensors in San Joaquin Valley, but what if you live in Iowa, right? You want to also have a say in your sensor network. And so the next portion of the talk will be, let's restrict the space of these networks and see, you know, can we design specific networks for states, cities, etc. So yeah, there's definitely a, a, a signaling error here. <laughs> and uh, actually, I have my own question. Mm -hmm. um, are most of the events that you capture well, like wildfires? It seems as if. Good. So let me, I took out the slide because I wanted to be OK on time, but yeah, good. I'll show you. Here is the second half of this data set. So what I showed you was the first half, and um, we see that for the first 11 years, you know, kind of annoying, um, annoying uh, limitation of this, the uh, first 11 years we had 72 uh, pollution events that were significant, 27 of them were fires. In the later 11 years, we had 77 significant events, and over half of them are fires. So even within the singular data set, we see the growing importance of fires. And if we were to um, go, to, you know, this only goes until the end of 2016. If we go to today, you know, I would say that even more would be from wildfires too. So it represents this huge um, uh, source of pollution. Do you have any more questions for this part? All right, then we'll take another two minute break. Third and final part of this talk tonight. 
So now we're going to transition into the last part, which is now um, taking the same ideas that I presented to you, but let's zone in on urban areas. And I really was interested in this idea of equity for, you know, there's this kind of the nice societally based reasons we should be interested because of um, sort of vulnerable populations bear the brunt of pollution and also might not be captured, but also thinking about race, income, and inequity is a very interesting optimization problem. So what we do here is use that same kind of framework for placing sensors, but reorganizing this library that takes into um, sort of ingests the data from the United States Census for both race and income, and kind of tries to balance air pollution exposure with uh, placing sensors in areas that are um, sort of more non-white and lower income. And so we're gonna look at four urban areas in the United States today. And these four urban areas uh, have histories of sort of income and racial segregation. Sorry there's a million different plots here, but I think they kind of work nicely together. Where we're here, we're looking at St. Louis, Missouri. It's a major American city with a long history of environmental racism, where it you know, has around three million people. You see that it's kind of like a funny little shape of St. Louis we choose. It's kind of the entire metropolitan statistical area that they call it. And you see that the Mississippi River kind of runs right down the middle of the city, dividing downtown St. Louis from East St. Louis. And East St. Louis is actually in Illinois. And there's this, been this long kind of history with the city of the government building kind of low-income housing on, in East St. Louis, pushing African Americans across the river, saying, you live here now, um, this is where the housing we built for you. And then when they want sort of municipality help from the city, they say, sorry, you live in a different state, we can't help you. And there's this long, interesting history of St. Louis. If we look at the decadal average of air pollution PM 2.5, you see that concentrations are generally highest in East St. Louis. And on the last column here, you see um, data from the census. So here uh, we chose proportion non-white, where non-white in this city is largely black African Americans. Um, the darker colors are more non-white, the lighter colors are more white. And you can see it's a very segregated city where half the city basically is one race and the other half is the other. Um, and you look at the household income kind of mirrors that um, in this city. And also it's a you know, major American city with three million people basically, and there's just really not that many sensors for this um, area. And so the results I get when using these different optimizations are uh, what I showed here. We're on the far left, this DMD sensor network. This is only considering air pollution alone. So you see that it kind of spreads sensors throughout this domain. Uh, the middle here where we incorporate uh, race data from the US Census, that we have way more sensors now in East St. Louis, um, also in an area called Granite City. Granite City has a um, well-known kind of polluting steel mill that's been a long driver of pollution. And we kind of capture this within this data set. We say that this is an area that should be monitored more. Uh, looking at uh, an in income-based optimization, you have way more sensors now placed in um, Jennings and Ferguson, Missouri, these kind of historic northern black suburbs. And really, I'm not sort of advocating for one optimization route over the other, but rather all three should be kind of considered when designing a sensor network. It provides kind of this roadmap. And you know, this kind of looks very clustered to the eye, right? You have what sensors really close to each other, but really, this is, this is one sensor. Um, uh, each of these dots is a kilometer, so a kilometer squared. And so, you know, they look really close on a map, but when you are in that neighborhood, you know, being in a kilometer square area, you're gonna have, you know, uh, a, bun a bunch more, and it still might not even capture the full dynamics of that place. Uh, let's look at Houston, Texas. This is a much larger city in terms of population and also area. It um, has really poor air quality right off the Gulf Coast. A lot of diesel trucking emissions, a lot of chemical and oil refineries in Houston. Uh, looking at the decadal average of PM2.5, you see that the concentrations are highest in the urban core and it kind of just smears to the west. Uh, you see that it's a very non-white major city. Uh, here it's largely Hispanic, so 
non-white Hispanic populations, except uh, what they call here the Houston Arrow. This is basically where all the white people live. This is where incomes are highest. This is where the best schools are, the highest property values are. Um, also, it's where all the purple air sensors are located that I said at the very beginning of this talk. It's directly correlated. And again, um, it's pretty under-monitored in terms of um, you know, having seven million people for only you know, 14 sensors here. And what the results look like here is that for the air pollution data alone, the MRDMD on the far left, you see kind of sensors throughout the domain, but really the highest concentration density is downtown. Makes sense, that's where concentration, the average is highest. If we look at both race and income incorporated uh, data, we see a specific neighborhood in particular is highlighted. Here, it's called the Ship Channel region in Houston. So this is where all these chemical oil and oil refineries lie in Houston. It's super undeveloped, very low income, very non-white, um, you know, kind of long stretches of underdeveloped land. A lot of diesel trucking emissions go through there. And most importantly, this is basically where all these chemical and oil refineries are. The rate of childhood leukemia is 56% higher than the national average in this area. So it's a very well-known kind of um, polluted region. Um, different uh, neighborhoods are also kind of pop out that are not captured within this um, optimization on the left. Uh, this neighborhood in Southwest Houston is actually upwind of a power plant that's out of view down here. And similarly in Trinity Houston Gardens, this is a majority kind of black neighborhood that is picked out from this optimization that is otherwise under monitored with very few monitors on the uh, air pollution alone uh, network. Um, so now we switch gears to Buffalo, New York. We try to kind of choose uh, urban areas that are throughout the United States. Buffalo is much smaller, much um, you know, in both space and uh, population, only a million people. It's right off of Lake Erie, um, so it, there's a lot of kind of lake breeze effects from the Great Lakes. Um, you see that it's a pretty segregated city where n north of downtown has the highest kind of here, it's black population, and also Niagara Falls and Love Canal, that's a very black neighborhood there. And the results for the sensor networks for Buffalo, and because it's, um, uh, because it's a smaller area, we have a smaller number of sensors we show here, it actually all produced kind of the same result. Um, and what's interesting is I thought there would be more sensors in this north of Buffalo, this kind of downtown African-American area, but what is highlighted is the, uh, this Niagara Falls and Love Canal region. And if you don't know Love Canal, there's a very interesting environmental history with this area. In the 1970s, there was kind of long, large-scale chemical dumping into the Love Canal that then leached into the soil and groundwater, uh, which then uh, caused sort of super high rates of uh, incidences of cancer among these sort of dominantly uh, African-American um, uh, communities. So, you know, ever since the 1970s, it's kind of been one of the big environmental injustices in terms of uh, environmental uh, policy in the United States. And finally, uh, we choose uh, look at Boston. So something people in this room will be familiar with, and this is a very generous, uh, <laughs> definition of Boston, basically going all the way from New Hampshire down to Rhode Island. It's basically kind of a New England um, uh, New England at large. It's kind of this uh, statistical metropolitan area of New England. Um, you see that the highest concentrations of PM2.5, the decade average, highest in Boston and kind of smears around that city. Makes sense, that's where a lot of the people live. But you know what's interesting is that the shape of segregation in the Boston area is much different than all the cities that I showed you, where large chunks of St. Louis, Houston, Buffalo are kind of segregated to be one race, whereas in Boston, it's these different neighborhoods, these little cities within this larger domain are really um, sort of uh, non-white enclaves. So you have Lowell, Massachusetts, Lawrence, Brockton, etc., Revere, Massachusetts. Um, these different cities that could be African American, they could be Hispanic, they, they have their own kind of uh, racial enclaves that are established in these different cities. It's a very pockmarked kind of um, a map that I show. 
and there's only 14 sensors for 5 million people for the EPA, but because Boston generally is actually a pretty white um, American city and high income, we actually see a, a decent amount of low cost um, purple air sensors here. Um, so there's a good purple air presence here. And the results are actually a bit confusing uh, that we find. This is, I presented this last because it's also the hardest to talk about. Um, so on the left is kind of a results for the Boston area. Um, you see sensors are kind of placed throughout. When we use a race optimized using census data, we find that a huge number of sensors are placed in South Boston. This makes sense. This is where a large amount of non-white people live, both African American and Hispanic populations. But what we find is that it take, actually takes away sensors from the other non-white kind of cities. Um, whereas the income-based optimization here um, adds sensors throughout. Sorry it's in red, it might be a little hard to see, but this income-based one adds sensors to Lowell, Lawrence, Brockton, Lynn, etc., all these cities that are fairly non-white. And what we're finding is that kind of the shape of segregation is really difficult to optimize because um, in a way, income from the U.S. Census is based on brackets. Uh, brackets kind of can um, average out some of the most disparate areas. So, um, you know, you place a lot of sensors within this kind of income bracket, whereas uh, race, it's a little harder to calculate. And it's very difficult to optimize this kind of very checker mark pattern of segregation. And you know, that's the end of my talk, and what I hope I impressed upon you is that sensor sh networks really need to be designed. These networks need to be designed or else we're going to lose out on the most kind of vulnerable populations um, because they are will naturally fall to the wayside, especially in a citizen science kind of volunteer framework. And what's exciting is that these ideas are already kind of being adopted. Um, we. Um, had interest from sensor placement in, um, in Lawrence, Massachusetts, so they asked where should we place sensors. Um, uh, we, told, we gave them our list and they're using that to incorporate that into their own network. Similarly in St. Louis, we have a collaborator there who wants to use these kind of data points to place sensor networks there. Also in Chester, Pennsylvania, which is a very um, sort of segregated and uh, historically black neighborhood, also wants to set up their own monitors. And really, we're seeing a new wave of kind of environmental justice work in which um, low-cost sensors are really kind of the future. They're cheap, easy to deploy, but people want to know where to place them. So there's a demand for that, and hopefully this kind of work, this kind of thinking can be a roadmap for that kind of study. And uh, thank you so much for your attention. Feel free to type any questions that you've had from the talk in the chat, and we'll, we'll ask those. <laughs> uh, so, uh, it's interesting, I don't know, your, your maps are very interesting. Um, it seems like, generally, we, your, your optimization put sensors in kind of like little fingers that came off of the city, a lot more than like in the middle of the city. Is there, in, in the city you got to Boston, when it's like a circle, and then it's like, is there like a reason for that or? Yeah, so that's a good point. So that's sort of a, an issue of the optimization we use. So this DMD really looks at variability. And in a way, the downtown core of a city, a lot of those emissions are very regular, right? So nine to five traffic happens or you know these kinds of polluting events, it's just kind of very high usually in this the variability doesn't change. Whereas if you get farther away from a city, this is where uh, the weather plays a bigger role. So you can have more anomalous events and the farther away you are from emissions uh, from the downtown core of a city, sort of the more variable you can get. So that's kind of one limitation of this work, but we use it as kind of another way of motivating how important weather kind of plays into this too. But yeah, definitely we see a lot of like weird kind of artifacts, but uh, generally those areas are also just very variable too. Yes, uh, very interesting talk, thank you. Um, I will, this is a very general question, but um, for the raw data that you use for analyzing statistics, um, 
are they offered from the government or is there like a formal institution that offers this? And if not, how can they like confirm the validity of the data? Mm. Yeah, so this um, underlying data set is produced from the Harvard Public Health School, uh, which um, all the data that I kind of described, it comes from a bunch of different sources and they combine it. Um, you can get this data easily available um, online. You just download it from, I think Columbia hosts it. But um, it's been validated against observation. So it's in that paper from 2019 that uh, they created this high resolution data product and then they compared it against like uh, EPA measurements and surface measurements and say, you know, the correlation of I'm forgetting, but it's like 0.8 or higher. So yeah, it's been validated um, in that sense. Thank you. Any other questions from the audience on YouTube or in person? If not, one of the questions that I always like to ask is what drew you to this research? Like how, how did you end up here? Is there something that excites you about it? Uh, I just kind of like using complicated math for societally relevant kind of questions and yeah, I think this is something that's not really talked about that much because it's hard, and it's usually we will, what we address it using intuition, right? Put a sensor near a hospital, put a sensor near a freeway because of what we think from first principles, but maybe there's a way we can let the data speak for itself. So that's the background. Mm -hmm. uh, Evan asks, what are the weak points of using PM2.5 compared to other potential measurements of air pollution? Um, weak points. So I guess the big three kind of pollutants we look, like to look at in my kind of work, one is PM2.5, so that's probably most important, interesting to me because of the health effects, it's the sort of most direct link. Um, it can be kind of blown around, so I guess that is a potential limitation, whereas uh, there's another pollutant called NOx, NO2, that comes, in, it's way more constrained to like source regions, so uh, it'll be very directly correlated with like uh, power plants, uh, freeways, roadways, etc. You can measure that much easier. Um, and it's, it's sensitive to the weather, but it's so tightly constrained to the sources that you can nail down the problems. And then there's ozone, which is another kind of historically important air pollutant. That's much harder to, um, to model because it has a longer lifetime and it can get formed at different places in the atmosphere. But that's also another important one for human health. That's, um, yeah, so PM2.5 is kind of centrally important, but um, there are other things that are also very important too. Did you bring up specifically VOC, UFC, DC? Okay, so. Uh, VOCs, volatile organic compounds, that could come from like factories usually or trees and natural sources as such. Um, we don't really have a good data set for that yet. Uh, UFBs are ultra fine, so it's kind of similar to PM2.5, just very small concentrations. And again, uh, all these kinds of different uh, sources are really interesting, but it's kind of limited to our, the data set that we have, and it's a PM2.5, which is kind of a conglomeration same time and in the same place we will have our final talk in the 2023 spring series which will be is your password in danger demystifying what quantum computers can do